how our lives should really look, okay? So in life, uh, Tommy, you're a businessman, you see, you see all the time, they got pie graphs, right? Okay, you go in there and they're gonna tell, okay, look, here's your profits, here's, here's your overhead, here's your this, and it's broken into a pie graph, right? Okay, so in pie graphs, and, and a lot of times in life, the world says, break your life into a pie graph. Okay, you have X amount of time, here's your, here's your circle, you got this much for family, you got this much for work, you know, you got like this much for hobbies, you got this much, and one time I was listening to a guy and he began to break that down and he's like, here's the problem with that, because then there's only one little part that says Jesus, right? There's one little piece of the pie that says Jesus. Now here's the problem with only one little piece of the pie saying Jesus. Everything I do should flow out of Jesus. Everything I do should flow out of who I am in Christ. So this is what he did. He took and he erased the pie graph, right? He drew a big circle and he made it like a wagon wheel, okay? So it's got a spoke in the middle, right? And then every single thing flowed out of the spoke in the middle, right? Of the hub in the middle, right? And so what he began to break down was the fact that, and I hope you guys can see this. You got to put on your imagination caps because I can't do it no better than this, okay? So you got a hub in the middle, and he said, this is what it's like. He said, every single piece flows out of Christ. Jesus is the hub of our life. Come on. He is the very cornerstone of our life. And if everything isn't flowing out of this circle, then it's wrong. It's in the wrong place. And I thought, now that's the strong teaching because I can, I can grab that with my mind, right? And so I begin to think about that in my life. Okay, what do I have in my life right now that's not flowing out of Christ? Is there relationships in my life that aren't flowing out of Christ? Is there uh, hobbies in my life that aren't flowing out of Christ? Is there anything in my life that doesn't go Christ first? Because, and now I'm not saying, oh, we got to turn into this like crazy. Oh, no, you can't do nothing because it's got to be Jesus. Listen, you should be able to honor God. And what did he say? Everything you do, everything you put your hand to, do it as unto the Lord. So I don't care if I'm out shooting guns. I can be honoring God. I can be sharpening my brothers. I can be sharpening my sister, right? Because I have that opportunity because every single place I go, as he told Abraham, as he told Moses, look, everywhere you go, you're, that's holy ground. So everywhere I go, Christ goes with me, right? So John 1, 1 uh, 10 through 13 says this, he was in the world and the world was made through him. This is talking about Christ. Yet the world did not know him. He came to his own, and his own people did not receive him, but to all who did receive him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God, who were born not of blood, nor of the will of flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. I didn't come simply because my parents had an urge one day. We got to get this right, okay? Okay. It wasn't by accident that I ended up in this world. And we could say, oh, man, it was just an accident. No, it wasn't. 100% of the time, it was because God put it in a man and a woman to recreate and make someone so that they could fulfill a specific destiny on their lives. On. Right? I was born with a destiny. Now, I was adopted. I had spent years and years in, in orphanages, years and years in foster homes. And by the time I was seven, I went in and I was actually physically adopted, moved to Northern California, out of Southern California. And God said, okay, this is your mom and dad. Now, they weren't the ones that bring me into this world, but because God had a plan for my life, that one day I would be in Crosby, Texas, right? How do I get them there? Well, I got to move them to Modesto, California, which is a... Methdesto, California, okay, listen, it's not a good place, but I got to get them here so that I could get them to Texas, okay? So I, I look back at my life, and I'm like, okay, God, I know, looking at my life, I know it wasn't an accident. Like, there's some crazy things that happen, but again, everything works to the good of those that love God according to his purposes, right? We forget about that part, according to his purposes. Man, I can purpose in my life all, all I want to. Oh, man, I'm going to do this. God's like, okay, okay. And then pretty soon I'm like, man, it's not really working out. Maybe, uh, maybe I'm going to do this, and I'm going to do this. I'm going to push it on no matter what I'm going to do. And he's like, well, it's not really working out. So what is he doing? He's always steering us toward his purposes, 
right? We have our own desires. We have our own plans, and we're trying to work those plans. And the whole time, God's going, I'm working you toward what I want, boy. You're going to get there. You're a little stubborn, but I'm going to get you there. Paul, on the road to Damascus, he's like, why are you kicking against the goad? And I can guarantee you God's sitting up in heaven all the time, and he's going, bro, why are you kicking against the goad? I'm like, well, I don't know. Because want to. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Here you go. You know, and so. My identity is in Christ and it should always flow out of my being, not out of my doing. The moment it flows out of my doing, it's out of myself. It's out of my flesh. God doesn't want us to live according to our flesh, but according to his purposes, his righteousness, his strengths. Right. Ephesians 2.10 says, For we are God's handiwork created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. God's handiwork. He created us, and then he bought us. The pastor always says it. He created us, and then he bought us. He put value into us. There is something to be said about the value that God put on our lives. God loves us. He cares for us. He created the world for us, right? One of the first things you see on your identity is your address, right? They want to know what community you come from. Now, a cop, if he's a good cop, he's going to look at your address. He's going to know exactly about, round about where you're from, what kind of neighborhood you live in. If you're from the wrong side of the tracks, you're from the right side of the tracks, right? He's an old New Caney Baptist Kevin. I got you. <laughs> I swear I'm on the good side of it. <laughs> but the truth is, God created us to live in a specific community. Community in the Bible is koinonia. Koinonia is this word that gets used a lot in church, but it's such a strong word. And it literally means to have communion with God or fellow believers. To have communion or common union with God or with fellow believers. So first, we have communion with Christ. 1 Corinthians 1.9 says this, God is faithful though whom, oh, through whom you were called into fellowship with his son, Jesus Christ our Lord. You were called into fellowship. Listen, when God saved you, right? Because God saved you, you didn't do it. I promise, you couldn't do it. We're not good enough. It's the truth. It was the blood of Christ on the cross. That was the only thing that could save us. God, the pastor says it all the time. The blood plus nothing. If we begin to put it in anything else, listen, we're so far from the truth. I heard a buddy of mine say the other day, he said, David, listen. He said, man, I came into a new revelation. He said, my dad was talking to me. He had some problems. He was a pastor. He said, David, he said, listen, my, my dad began to speak to me. He said, listen. There is a thing in life that happens. He was a pastor. He was struggling with some stuff. He went to some other pastors and they said, oh, no, you just got to try harder. You just got to read more, right? And how many of us have heard that, right? Oh, you're struggling with sin. Oh, you got to read more. You got to struggle, right? You got to somehow within yourself not do this. And Christ is going, what are you? No, it was never about try harder. It was always about trust more always about trust more right if you trust in the fact that the blood plus nothing saves me then that's what i trust in if it's it's never about my doing if it's about me i'm gonna fall short every time i promise i'm gonna mess up my wife will tell you she may not she may lie for me i appreciate that but the truth is i mess up right so what happens we do that we fall short of the glory of god but if I put it in and of myself to do it, then it becomes self-righteousness. It's not about the righteousness of God on my life. It's not about me fulfilling everything that I ever needed to fulfill simply because that's what he did on the cross. He fulfilled all the laws and all the prophets. Every word that was ever spoken about him, he fulfilled it to the fullness. It's my job just to say, yes, Lord. It's his job to do the rest. He said, the battle is yours. He said, the victory is yours, but the battle is mine. All you got to do is show up. Most days, we get up out of bed. Hey, guess what? There's a chance. Why? Because his power, not my power. 
his wisdom, not my wisdom. And the moment I begin to, and it's not being lazy. Now, I'm not telling you be lazy and not try and not do anything, right? That's, that's the opposite of what I'm telling you. But we're going to be actively pursuing the one that is actually the all in all. And when I begin to lean on that, then my life can be transformed. So it's not about the try, it's about the trust. If we continue to just keep striving and striving and striving and striving, we're going to miss it every single time. So our address matters. Koinonia, it's communion. We have communion in Christ and we have communion with his people. It's Ephesians 2, 19, 22. Simply says this, so then you are no longer strangers and aliens, but you are fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God. 20, built on the foundations of the apostles and the prophets, Christ Jesus himself being the cornerstone. Jesus is the cornerstone. In whom the whole structure, everything, being joined together, grows into holy temple of the Lord. In him, you also being built together into a dwelling place for God by the Spirit. We are the dwelling place of God, but... Our structure needs to be built with Christ as the cornerstone. If we're not building our structure with Christ as the cornerstone, just like that wagon wheel. If that hub is bad, wagon wheel's bad. If any part of those spokes are bad, the wheel is bad. Everything flows out of that hub. And so just like a building that Christ said, I am the cornerstone. You've got to continue to trust in me. Trust in that big stone that was placed first. Because when you trust in that big stone, those, all those other stones just kind of get built up around it. And all of a sudden, they're strong. They're, they're tight. They have a lot of structure. So, it's important that we have koinonia. It's our community. It's the way we live. It's how we live. It's whom we live with. But if they're not seeing you as who you're supposed to be, then they're missing out also. It's our job to live like Christ so that they see Christ in us. Two, it always has a description of what we look like, right? Now, I, I, I saw a, a funny thing. I'm getting my hair cut yesterday, and there was a young lady cutting my hair, and she was very nice. My daughter was over there being my daughter, and she's sitting there, and she's like, she's like, oh, you know, Bobo asking her all these questions, and she looks up, and the young lady has a uh, uh, her picture and her license and all that, you know, her cosmetology license and everything, and it's sitting up on the, above the mirror, and JJ goes, who's that? <laughs> and I, that's one of those moments as dad, I'm like, oh, here we go. And she was very gracious to JJ, and she goes, oh, that's me with the right lighting and uh, about 10 or 15 years ago. <laughs> and I'm going, Ouch. <laughs> but she had this like orange Oompa Loompa tan and she had long different color hair. And so JJ's going, look, you don't look anything like your license says, right? When a cop pulls your ID, looks at the license, he looks at you. First, he's going to look at the picture and then he's going to look at you and be like, well, that ain't right. Then he's going to do what? He's going to look at the description. Okay. Light hair. Blue eyes, okay, five foot ten, okay, 180 pounds, okay, yeah, that looks like David Clowers, right? Or he's going to go, green hair, 265 pounds, five foot two, he's going, wait, that don't look like you. The description's not matching up. See, in life, if we're not careful, our coworkers, our friends, our family, they're looking at our lives and they're saying, well, I know what the description of a Christian, a believer, is supposed to look like. And yet when I look at you, do I see that picture or do I see another picture? And I looked at that and I thought, man, I said, why does a cop need to have a description? Simply this, so that he knows if you're a fake or not. He needs to have a reference point to know whether or not this is fake or this is the real thing. And I thought, man, isn't that so true in our lives? Jesus and the rest of the world are looking at the description of what a believer is. 
And then they're looking at our lives and they're going, Meh. or they're going, absolutely, 100%. Now, I pray that that's all of us. But on some days, that may not be me and that may be me. Just depends on whether you catch me on Wednesday or Thursday, okay? No. <laughs> so, in life, we have to make sure that what this thing is saying about us is looking like us. Why? It says a man can look in the mirror and he can walk away and he can forget what he was looking into. He forgot what he looked like. Why? Because our mirror is Jesus Christ. And the moment we begin to say, well, man, I want to look like, yeah, it's a little quiet, H, you're right. But <laughs> I want to look like H. Man, oh, man, if I could just look like H. And God's going, bro. He's going, no, but seriously, look, I can say it myself. Hey, hey, uh, man, if I could just look like David. And God's going, really? Really? That's the highest standard you want to make? Do you realize that my son, Jesus Christ, the perfection of the world, came into this world, did everything right so that you could try to compare yourself and make yourself look like another one of my son? Come on. Come on. You're selling yourself short. Not that person. It's not that person's fault. It's your fault. Comparison's a killer. And if we're not careful, we'll sell ourselves short because the only comparison we need to be making is that of Christ. I'm to look like Christ. I'm not to look like you. I'm not to look like my wife. I'm not to look like nobody else. I'm to look like David Clowers, the son of God. Come on. Not David Clowers, the one that likes to build stuff. Not David Clowers, the one that likes to go fishing. Not David Clowers, the one that likes to go hunting. The one that likes to play with guns. No, I am to be David Clowers, the image of Christ. Now, that's not an easy image to live up to. I get it. That's a tough one, right? So, we have a description on our licenses that say, I'm to look like this. If I don't look like that, then the world's going, man, I don't know. I don't know. The doing part of our lives, right? So the next part in our wallets is the doing part of our lives, right? The first part's the believing, the being part. This is who I am. The next part is the doing part. When you take out my wallet, it's a little rough, right? Beat up. Shows that I work, right? It's all torn up. But the next part in my wallet is going to be stuff like Home Depot cards, right? Uh, I got all kinds of stump grinding stuff. I got, uh, let's see, I got a sandwich card, right? This is, these are all things that are hobbies, that are likes, that are businesses, right? A lot of the times when I have to do any business dealings, I'm looking through, make sure I don't yank that thing out. When I, I keep a card in there so that I have a quick reference, right? So that I can be like, hey, listen, I got a business dealing today. I need to get in here. The next part of our wallets is the doing side, right? So first is our business. Proverbs 16.3 says, commit your work to the Lord. Submit and trust them to him and your plans will succeed if you respond to his will and his guidance. I love the Amplified because he says, if you respond, it's not about just doing it, but it's rather in doing it in the correct way, according to his purposes, his plans, then all of a sudden my life begins to succeed. My life begins to go in the direction that he intended my life to do, right? So we're looking to succeed in our business dealings. Our hobbies. I, I promise you, there's some gun stuff in here in my wallet. There's right when we look through the, the wallets, we see all kinds of crazy stuff. And there's stuff in there. We're like, where did that come from? Right. Especially if you're ever like on the plants or anything like people are always passing out different cards. Hey, man, look me up whenever you're doing this. Hey, man, look me up. And you're like looking and you're going. What the heck was that for? I don't even remember that card. So. Our hobbies, God intended us to have hobbies. God intended us to enjoy the world that he created for us. He wants us to have life and life more abundant. But we got to make sure that we don't never make those hobbies bigger than the one that created us to enjoy the hobby. Okay, that's where the problem begins to lie. Do we have balance in our life enough to say, okay, this is becoming an impedance into my life. 
or are we running back and we're saying, hey, you know what I really want is, uh, man, ah, man, uh, yeah, man, Pastor C, I would have come out on Muscle Car Sunday, but I had a fishing tournament. I had a, you know, whatever, car race. I had a, whatever the hobby, the small thing of our life, if we're not careful, we allow that thing to become the biggest thing of our life. Why? Because it's fun. It's enjoyable, right? And we're like, oh, yeah, I got to do this. This is this. But if it impedes into the rest of my life, then I've allowed it to become a hindrance. So hobbies are fantastic, but in our wallets, we can find them. What else do we find? Now, if you're like my dad, you're going to find some pictures in there, right? Got the old school wallet. He flips it out. He tells me all the time. He's like, man, he said, David, I was at a... He said, I was at the Walmart the other day. I'm like, oh, yeah. He's like, yeah. He said, uh, there was a lady. She said, oh, man, you got to see how beautiful my grandkids are. And my dad always says, like, and my wife will tell you, it's embarrassing. He, I was there. And he did this. He said, oh, man. He said, I'm going to show you something. You're going you're gonna to sit there and just go, ugh, to your grandkids when you see mine. And I'm going, <laughs> <laughs> he's like, you're going to think your grandkids are ugly when you see mine. And I'm going, Oh my God. I mean, he ain't lying, but (laughs) no, but in all reality, you know, we have pictures in our wallets. Why do we have pictures to remember the relationships that we're in? Right? Because we want it near and dear to us, right? There was a time where we didn't have a phone, right? And we didn't have like 5 million, like if me and Tommy get together, me and Nate get together, I'm going to be like, Hey, look, look at this, look at this, look at this, look at this, right? That's what we do now. We're like, oh, man, look, look at this picture because we have it available to us. Before, we didn't have that. If we wanted to brag about how hard our girlfriend was, we had to, like, pull out the wallet, be like, I swear this is my girlfriend. Nah, that's just something you cut out of a magazine. Quit lying. We're like, right? So we had, to get, we had to have pictures in our wallet so that we could show people, look, I'm in relationship with this person. This isn't something I just made up, I promise. It's not something I printed off the computer. So I'm in relationship with them. Why? Because they're in our wallets. We want to keep them close. Our relationships are so important to our life. They add value to our lives. Every one of my friends adds value to my life. Every one of my friends. And so I, when I look at my relationships, I realize just how important they are. We've got to have relationships. Relationships. Psalms 133.1. How wonderful and pleasant it is when brothers live together in harmony. Or in unity. That, that right there, man, you can, you can drop the mic. when you Because, re- man, listen, you want to know why Jesus came? Why the, the upper room was shaken? Why fire fell down in the upper room? Simple. They said they were of one accord. They were all trying to do the same thing. There was 120 people trying to do the same thing. God's going whoa, hey, I got to show up in this meeting right here. They're literally of the same accord. They were trying to go for the same thing. All they were doing was seeking God so that he would come back because he said he was coming back. So they were looking for the Holy Spirit, and they said, we know he's coming. We want to get in the same accord. We want to get of the same mindset so that we know he's coming. Relationships are so important in our lives. The last thing we'll find in our wallets is our value our money, our currency, whether it's from a plastic one or a paper one or a metal one. The truth is our value is always found in our wallet, right? If you take your card out and you swipe it in the machine, it'll tell you exactly what your value is. It'll tell you what your current balance of your life is. Our life, same way. Our life same way. At any point in time, we can have, <laughs> you're good. At any point in our life, we can sit there and we can say, oh, I am worth this much, right? We can take the accumulation of all of our stuff and they can say, this is my net worth. I'll tell you this, you're worth exactly what somebody's willing to pay for you. Everybody said, oh, man, you know, for me, I love guns. You know, I sit there and, oh, man, this gun is worth this much. But in my life, is it really worth that much? No. Some guns aren't, right? Some, it be a boat. It could be anything. It could be whatever in your life. The only thing that something is worth is what you're willing to pay for it. 
Do you realize that the greatest commodity in all of the world was given for you? The greatest value of anything in the universe beyond that which we could imagine, think, or even see, Jesus Christ said, you know what? I'll step out of a perfect heaven, gold-laid roads. I'll go down and become a baby, have to deal with puberty, adolescence, listening to people, poop on the roads, you know, all the crazy stuff that these guys had to deal with. And he said, yeah, I'll endure all of that so that I could be the perfect gift for you because you're worth it. God looked down into the advance of the world. Listen to this verse. Matthew 6, 20. uh, No, we're going to go Ephesians 1. Even before he made the world, God loved us, chose us in Christ to be a holy without fault in his eyes. Even before he made the world, he saw you. He made you already in his mind. And he said, what's the best thing? What's the greatest thing that I could do for HD today? I know I could create a world. I could create oceans and he can fish in it. I can create woods and he can hunt in it. I can create cars and he can drive them, right? I could put it into the mind of a man to create computers and do amazing things. And he did all of that because he saw value in you. Before the world was even created, Jesus saw value in you too. Because he says that he was the lamb that was slain before the world was created. Jesus knew before the world got created that he was going to go to a cross for me, for you. I ain't worth it. I'm going to tell you right now, I wasn't worth it. But he thought so. So he gave the greatest commodity in all of the world so that you could be blessed. I say this one for last on purpose. Because coming up on October, it's Pastor Appreciation Month. Our pastor. He's created this church 19 years ago. This will be our 19th celebration of being a church. It's a huge deal for us. It's a huge deal. 19 years. Think about a a man that created a business. 19 years. And it's running. It's good. It's been doing well ever since he started it. A man should be very compensated for what he created. There ain't no difference with our pastor. He gets paid. I'm not going to sit here and act like he's broke. He didn't get. Look, he gets paid. But I can tell you. Where's your value system? Why? Tell you like this. Matthew 6, 21 says, wherever your treasure is, there the desires of your heart will also be. Wherever your treasure, where's your wallet? Let me see your receipts. I'll tell you what you value. Let me see your receipts. Let me see the last thing you spent with your credit card. I can begin to tell you really, really quickly the things you love and the things you don't love right? You got a nice big house note. You love that house. You may not love that house because it's got a nice big house note, but you love the house. Why? Because the note, because you put a lot of money into it, right? Every single place that you're willing to put value to, it's a showing of where your heart is. You got a nice big truck, value. You got a nice home, value. Boat, whatever. Golf clubs, bows, whatever. I mean, just whatever. You can think of it. Purses, shoes, clothes, value. I'm going to tell you this. Honor has more to do with you than the person you're honoring. Now, when the man or the woman that you're honoring is good, it's easy right? Makes it easy to put value on it. But he said, honor your mother and your father. Okay. So if God said, honor your mother and your father, did he say, honor your good mother and your good father? No, he never said that. He did not never say, hey man, you know what? As long as mom and dad's good, you honor. No. He said, honor those that are in the kingdom. Does that mean everybody in the kingdom's good? No, it doesn't. 
wherever your treasure is, there the desires of your heart will be. On the 9th, October 9th, next week we have um, conference, which is celebrating 19 years. On the 9th, I believe Miss Rhea is going to be doing something with the kids to honor pastor. Tommy, I, I don't know if we want to do it at the end of the month, maybe at the end of the month. I'm going to say last Sunday in October. Pastor doesn't know this yet, but I want to have buckets in the back. I want you guys to be preparing now to give this man a gift. And listen, if you can't afford it, that's fine. I get it. Trust me, I get it. But I can tell you this. How much do you honor that man? How much do you value that man? How much do you value this church? Are you tithing? Are you, that shows you value the church, right? It's not a, it's, it shows that you value God. And now I'm not up here soliciting all your money. I don't, that's up to you. But I will say this. A man is worth what you say he's worth. And I can tell you this. Last year wasn't all that much. I'm going to tell you that. Pastor may not even like that I said that. I'm going to be honest with you. But I can say that. How much do we honor, Pastor? How much do we love and value what he does when he gets up here every week and he goes to the funerals and he goes to the weddings and he goes when your kid's sick? And he, how much? Do we value our pastor? How much do we value our friends? So at the end of the next month, it's Pastor Appreciation Month. I just want to honor him. I want to honor him. I want him to know that, you know what? The little country church doesn't just think you another man. Doesn't just think you, oh, thank you for getting up and preaching on Sunday. The truth is he's very good at what he does. Very good at what he does. It's hard to find another that can communicate and be real like he is. So at the end of next month, I want to be able to take up an offering that he says, you know what? My church loves me. Now, you guys give him stuff all the time. I'm not, I'm not saying that we're not doing good enough. But I will say this. How cool would it be that we could stand up at the end of the, uh, next month, give him a check, and he's going, man, I don't deserve that. I can tell you this, as a pastor, if you can stand up there and be like, oh, thank you, <laughs> you probably didn't value that man very much. <laughs> Let's just be honest, right? If you work in a job and they're like, hey, man, I want to give you a bonus, and you look at that bonus check and you go, oh, thank you. <laughs> they didn't value very much. I just want this man to understand how much we love him, how grateful we are for him, and just how much he is valued at the Little Country Church. We love pastor. Most of all, we love God. We honor the gift of God in pastor. He's a gift given from God. And so we're going to continue to honor him that. It doesn't matter how great or terrible they are, but rather the value you place on them. We love our pastor. Let's show him. We love each other. Let's show each other. We love the kingdom. Let's show the kingdom. I love you guys this morning. I pray that this has helped you. I pray that you understand that our life flows out of our trust, not our try. Our life flows out of our be, not our do. It is so important that we learn those things. Because if not, we're relying on ourselves. Amen. Lord, I love you. I thank you. I'm grateful for this morning. I'm grateful for the fact that I had an opportunity to honor our pastor. I had an opportunity to honor you. But most importantly, I have opportunity to introduce people to real identity. And that is in Christ Jesus and Christ Jesus alone. You are the answer. You are the one we want. You are the one we need. And in that, I say thank you. I say thank you that you were willing to step out of heaven. That you were the gift of unimaginable value. And yet you said I was worth that. I don't see how I was, but you did because you loved me, because you loved me first. And so, Lord, I say I love you more than anything on this planet. I want to honor you, and I want to honor the man that you have placed in our lives as pastor because it, the Bible says that he is a gift of God. And so, Lord, let us to be that which you've called us to be, and that is to be doers of the word. That is to be not only hearers, but doers. As we've heard this message today, I pray that we would do the things that we've heard. Me first and foremost. And Lord, I just thank you for everybody watching online. I just pray that they would be blessed this morning. We love you and we thank you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.